Hey everyone, I'm Robert Dempsey, CEO of Atlantic Dominion Solutions, a web development shop in Orlando, Florida. I'm a certified Scrum Master and the creator of Scrumd, Simple Project Management for Agile Teams. You can find me on Twitter at rdempsey. I'd like to welcome you to the first part of our series, Introduction to Agile and Scrum. So software development used to go something like this. You would have a requirements gathering process. You would then move into design, followed by implementation, then verification, and finally maintenance. This way of developing software was known as waterfall. Now waterfall had its pros. You could find bugs early in the process, and in theory, if you had correct requirements in the beginning, you would have less problems later. There was a big emphasis on documentation, which historically developers have hated doing. It was also simple and disciplined and good for stable projects. On the other side though, as we know, with software development, each step is not mutually exclusive. Also, developers are usually not clairvoyant. You can't tell all the, the bumps in the road that you're going to encounter up front. There was a huge amount of documentation overhead. It was rigid and inflexible. And who's ever heard of a stable project? So when we come back into reality, we see that development phases overlap and that software is emergent. The farther along we go, the more we know. Also, done is a moving target. And when we're developing, flexibility is required due to an ever-changing business environment. And finally, collaboration is essential. So enter the Agile Manifesto. The Agile Manifesto lays out the philosophy for Agile development. Some of those philosophies include individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. Before we get into Agile and Scrum, I'd first like to dispel a few of the myths that are running around out there. The first is that there's a lack of discipline in Scrum. The self-managing teams mean you can do whatever you want, whenever you want. We'll see that Scrum puts in a set of practices and has a framework within to work, within which we work rather. Second is that there's a lack of visibility. The truth could not be farther from this. And finally, probably the biggest myth that is out there, and a phrase that I've heard many times, is that won't work here. The fact is, is that in order to fully implement Agile and Scrum, and to really take advantage of it, nine times out of 10, an organization must change. A lot of organizations fear change, and a lot of them won't change. Therefore, Scrum does not work for them. And that leads us to the question, what is Agile? Agile is a group of philosophies and practices that provides the ability to handle changing requirements. It includes iterative development, a large amount of collaboration between the business and development teams. We have self-organizing and self-managing teams, and it stresses leadership over management. So using these and a set of practices, a team gains the ability to continuously adapt. There are many agile methods, many agile frameworks. A few of those are extreme programming, test-driven development, feature-driven development, behavior-driven development, and finally Scrum. But I'm not talking about this kind of Scrum. I'm talking about this Scrum. The Scrum we're interested in is a framework for developing complex products and systems. It's grounded in empirical process control theory, which has three facets, transparency, inspection, and adaptation. There are three inspect and adapt points in Scrum, and they are number one, the sprint review and planning meetings, number two, the daily Scrum, and number three, the retrospective. So there's two groups of folks involved in Scrum. The first group are the pigs, and they're called pigs because they have their bacon on the line. And the main pigs are the Scrum team. And the Scrum team is composed of the product owner, the Scrum master, and the team. And if you're not a pig, then you're a chicken. And chickens are involved, but they are committed. And some examples of chickens are users, stakeholders, managers, and other business units. So the Scrum Master is the main driving force behind the process, behind Scrum. They help the team and organization adopt and use Scrum. 
They are a leader, not a manager, which is a very big distinction. So as a leader, the roles that they play are generally that of coach, teacher, and supporter. Now the product owner manages and controls the product backlog. They're responsible for the value of the work done. They keep the product backlog in priority order and visible to everyone. And the product owner is a single person, not a committee. Another very important point. And so, this person must have authority and the respect of others in order to succeed. And finally, the product owner is the single point of contact for the team. And the team are the ones that are turning these product backlog items into increments of potentially shippable functionality. And I say potentially shippable because if at the end of the sprint, the product owner decides, let's push this into production, that increment should be able to be put into production. So the team is cross-functional, meaning that everyone that needs to be on the team to make these selected stories happen should be. So if you need a UI person, you bring them on board. If you need a tester, or QA, you bring them on board. Developers, bring them on board. Business analysts, bring them on board. Cross-functional. The team is also self-organized, so everyone contributes. But again, going back to the, the leadership versus management, as a scrum master, I do not tell my team what to do. I do not micromanage them. They determine who does what within the team. And in the team, there are no job descriptions, no titles, and no exceptions to this. And everyone sinks or swims as a team. Now, the optimal team size is around 7, plus or minus 2, and the team composition can change at the end of a sprint. But if it does, then you want to be careful in doing so, so that you don't mess up with the velocity. So now, let's take a look at the overall Scrum process. So with Scrum, we start with this product backlog, which is a list of all of our features that we have. We then move to release planning. From there, we have a, a sprint, which can be a time box between one and four weeks. Typically, uh, for us, we do two weeks. The sprint produces an increment. After that, we have a sprint review. And finally, the sprint retrospective. And after the sprint retrospective, the entire process begins again. In the next part of our introduction to Agile and Scrum series, we'll delve into each piece of the Scrum process in detail. See you then.